<laughs> okay. Next, the last example. Is that, is that cool? So that was a little bit about, about scaling up with grassland. And then last, I want to talk about a wetland project that's still, still in theory in progress. So this is um, uh, our story of restoring wetlands in Turkey. So here we work, we work in eastern Turkey, so along the Iranian, Armenian, Georgian border, that area of the country, so the far eastern area. The challenges here is that we've seen massive alteration of the landscape, massive, massive, massive alteration, and long-term alteration. The Romans deforested Turkey, and then the Ottoman Empire after them decided they want to do the same thing. They, they continue to cut trees down. So it's, it's been a wholesale landscape degradation for millennia here. So it's a huge challenge. In addition, when we started, they had literally zero capacity. We added up one time on the back. And so, you know, Turkey's about 70 million people in the country. We added up one time on the back of an envelope, there were probably something like 50 or 150 people in the whole country that were part of any kind of environmental NGO in the whole country. And most of them were in the, in the capital or in Istanbul. That includes WWF, Nature Conservancy, BirdLife International, all these, all these groups that you could think of. The very, very, very little capacity there. Okay, so the key metrics here we want to look at are how much plant material is, is out there. And as always, we're interested in biodiversity, so diversity. Some of the key things that we're focused on are, are bird, uh, bird, mate, bird metrics because uh, we, our NGO works on um, trying to bolster uh, people's understanding of the environment, but also pushing ecotourism for people to look at birds and stuff. So birds are one of our key things we're interested in. Again, we're taking a phased approach. In addition to just figuring out how to do the restoration though, this, the, the, the broader goals here were to try to educate people about the value of ecosystem services generally, and also just demonstrate basic ecological principles, basic conservation principles to these folks. Okay. So to give you a sense for what we're talking about here, um, uh, it's about twice the size of California if we're talking about uh, population. The density overall, overall, the density of people per unit area is about the same as California. Um, and the scale there, California and Turkey, that, that's the, uh, the, the maps aren't exactly to scale with one another so again if you, you can tell from the picture there but um it, you know it's it's about um twice a little bit less than twice the <laughs> territory of the state of california um yeah uh, not quite as coastal as we are this part here is next to the black sea this part over here is is looking out towards the mediterranean but um, most of this uh, over here is all landlocked. So they have a, a lower proportion of their population that lives in the coastal fringe. And they have very little area that's in any form of protected area. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a lot of challenges here. The first step was just to figure out what is there. Can we get a species list? What are the species? Uh, what plants are even there. Turns out it actually was a great place for us to work because a lot of the species were familiar to us because there are invaders. So the native things there were, so that, that's one of the sites where they evolved, right? And then spread around the world. So we want to figure out uh, how messed up things are. We want to talk about the indicators of ecological functioning. And um, we'd like to assess things not just with some of the traditional metrics that we talk about, but maybe with value to people, uh, very proximally and very obviously, because we're trying to convince folks to do this as opposed to something else, let's say. So we need to make these arguments, not in academic journals, but in um, living rooms and things like that. Again, we're going to do the restoration as a series of phase experiments with increasing complexity. So I'll tell you just one story, then we'll get back to the 
get back to our restoration talks. But um, let's see. Uh, so this is this is uh, right when the bird flew. You guys won't remember this because you're too young. But this is this is about uh, not about eight years or so ago. And this is when the bird flu was getting crazy, and um, one of the places where it it showed up in people. Um, and, and killed a little boy, for example, was in this part of Turkey. This is, this is a village right next to the Iranian border. This is almost into Iran. This is a village, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember the name of this village now. Dogobayets? I think it might be Dog, no, is that, well, anyway. Um, so this is a Turkish village. I see, excuse me, no, no, I, I did that wrong. This is a Kurdish village. This is a Kurdish village. So these folks are, are generally very, very poor. The stuff you see behind us looks like rock. It's not. It's actually dried cow dung. That's the main building material, um, or one of the main building materials. And so um, we're going, we're, we're driving around, and we're trying to get to uh, this area. There's a wetland just sort of behind where my friend's taking the picture. Behind his back, there's a big wetland. We're trying to get down there because that's where bird flu went, and we're, we're going to collect some, maybe some, some birds to... Uh, uh, this sounds super stupid at the time, <laughs> but, but we're going to see if we can collect some material to send to some researchers who are trying to figure out if there's uh, there's bird flu uh, there. Um, and so people, sometimes people started calling this village the bird flu village. So we go in there and we drive in and we're in this little minivan, this little, uh, not minivan, that's not the right term, but like a like a VW bug type of a, a VW van kind of thing. We're driving around and it's, and it's very rainy and it's so rainy we realize there's no way we can get out to the wetland. It's all super slick and muddy and we can't, can't get out there. And so, um, so now in Turkey, everybody goes to school and everybody wears uniforms when they go to school, uh, public school everywhere. And so these kids that are in this uniform, these guys are, are they were just on break, so they went home for lunch and they were getting ready, to, they were either coming from or going to school, I can't remember. And so, um, I, I'm the only American here, right? So I look very different than everybody else. I look weird. Well, I, I look weird anyway, but I, I stand out, uh, right? And so um, these kids are like seeing me and they're saying, ah, hello, 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 right? Uh, hello, I like you, you know, things, they're, they're trying their, their English out, right? I'm like, hey, how's it going? And so we jump out to take a photo, and that's me getting out of the car, and, and my friend's taking a photo, and I t motion for all the kids, hey, come close, let's take a photo. And if you notice, there's these two girls in the back, mm -hmm. right? So they're hanging out back there. And uh, so I thought it was a, so this is a, a primarily Islamic society. The, the country of Turkey is secular, but, but you know, over 90%, 95% of the population um, identify as Muslim. And in some of the areas where we work, there's women walk around with full, um, you know, hijabs and things like that. And so I thought these young girls were just being demure at the time. But if you actually look in that little girl's hands, she actually has a bunch of eggs. And so what was actually going on was she was worried that I was from WHO or something like that, right? So we're taking pictures, and then right after we take this picture, all these guys come out of the buildings and start yelling at us, get the hell out of here, tell the kids, leave them alone, go away from them, go away from them. So she turns around and runs away. So if I zoomed in this, you'd see she has a bunch of uh, chicken eggs in her hands. Now, there, no one is allowed to have chickens in this village because that's one of the reservoirs for bird flu. So the WHO came in, and so I don't remember off the top of my head, I don't remember the numbers, but it was something like, okay, we're going to pay all you uh, poor, and these guys are really poor. These are subsistence people, right? They, they don't have these chickens for pets. They have these chickens to lay eggs and to eat or to sell in the market. There's a bigger town a few miles away. And, um, and so they came in, and I don't remember the number, but they said, we're going to give you guys, you know, uh, you know, 80 cents a chicken. You gotta bring in all, firstly it's illegal. You're not allowed to keep more chickens or geese, but we're, not, we're gonna pay, pay you for them. We're gonna give you, you know, however much money they offered them. It was less than half of what they can get by taking that animal and going and selling that animal in the market, let alone how much they could make from the eggs being laid over the course of a year. So these are desperately poor folks, right? 
Now, if these guys had offered whatever it was, 15 bucks a head, well, they would have got every single bird around. They would have pulled everything out of the rafters. They would have, here you go, right? But as it was, they had to, um, so they saw in their best interest, this was going to kill them. They were going to starve to death, right? They're not going to have food. So they, quote unquote, gave away their birds, right? And they clearly saved a bunch because, because after the kids all go away, the people start coming out of the village and they start yelling at us to get the hell out of here. Get out of here, get out of here. And my friends start getting nervous. They're like, uh, we, we should probably go, let's just go. So I, I climb back in the car, we close the door, we start driving away and we round the corner and that's when we see this. So all these chickens outside, totally at the time illegal, right? So that's the kind of relationship that these folks have with the government. They are ignored. Well, firstly, they're, they're Kurdish, so they're generally ignored. They're a minority group. Secondly, um, they're poor. Even more, probably more important than that, they're, they're, they're really, really poor folks. And they did not vote for the conservative government that's in power. And so there's another tick against them. All these ticks against them. But what it amounts to is these folks not trusting the outside you know, the higher government, the outside folks, they trust only their inner circle. And we see this a lot around the world, right? People will trust their neighbors, not so much their city government, county government, etc. Okay, so we have to deal with that layer of stuff as well. So the challenges to do, the rest, to do restorations here are first and foremost that we had, uh, that no ecological restoration had ever been done from, from just ever. Next, what little efforts had been done were very naive and, and, and extraordinarily basic. So outside of restoration, conservation in general is, is not really practiced there. They have a massively degraded, massively overexploited system, massively overgrazed primarily. And then as we were just mentioning, a high degree of poverty, a lot of subsistence agriculture and herding, meaning these folks um, are going to take that, that animal protein, sell that, and get um, you know, sugar and rice to eat. So this is not, generally speaking, folks getting wealthy, not, generally speaking, folks doing a lot of investment. It's folks living from day to day. Um, I'll send you guys a link to, most of these are on my iTunes U. We don't really use iTunes U anymore because you guys told me a few years ago that you don't like it very much. So that's why I mostly put stuff up on YouTube. But I'll, link you, I'll send you guys some links from my, um, my uh, Turkish conservation podcast from back then. Uh, on the left are wolves. These are wolf pups. Um, we have a huge problem with people killing wolves there because wolves are, you know, of course evil. Like wetlands, they're bad. Of course, you know they're bad. So what do we do? You shoot and kill wolves. In this case, these wolves, we had three pups. Um, they unfortunately all died, but um, uh, died of distemper, actually. We tried to tell the vets they need to give a distemper shot, and they said we didn't know what we were talking about, and they died of distemper. Um, <laughs> um, but huge challenges. So these wolves were recovered from a village. So one of the things you do is you go and you blow away the predator and mom, and then you take the pups back home and uh, they'll den in the winter time, so they're relatively easy, so you kill them. And these guys have been, most likely, pulled out of the den and then the guys had them as pets for you know, a month or two, but they're not like dogs, they're, they're wild animals, right? So they don't, they don't respond the same way as dogs necessarily. And then when they got to be a problem, the village chief took them and said, oh, and gave them to us because people, they, they, people bring us everything, bring us birds, bring us whatever, because there is no capacity anywhere other than us. And so they say, here you go, here's some, here's some wolves. What wolves? What, where are the wolves? Where's the mom? Oh, I don't know. We just found them one day. Not really? <laughs> um, so they brought us to them in that cardboard box, right? Uh, on the right-hand side, over there, that's an ibex, that's an endangered species. This is just on the back of someone's porch. Someone blew it away. And in fact, when I started taking pictures, my, my colleagues got very, very nervous that we have to leave. We have to leave now, because that guy saw you taking pictures and he's gonna come essentially <laughs> kick our butt. So we have a lot of stressful things, a lot of challenges here. Um, we used to have tigers in um, uh, Turkey. Up until 
not too long ago, up until like the late 60s possibly even. And we're talking with one guy one time and they were saying, oh yeah, we, we had one in 19, whatever it was, 73 or something. I said, really? Yeah. How do you know? Oh, because we shot it. What? So they're out there, they're out there, the special forces, and they were practicing target practice, practice by shooting these, uh, shooting these predators. So it's a tough place to work. It's a, it's a really tough place to work. They have very little in the context of restoration skills. So this is outside one of the universities that we worked with. It's actually, it's actually on university land. And these guys were trying to do a, um, a tree restoration project. And that's what you see right there, these pines that are planted. And even from here, you guys can tell those pines maybe not doing too well, right? A lot of them are browning and dying. So even something basic, like just doing reforestation, uh, not, not, the, not the most skilled, at even, even on university land, planting trees and, and getting them to grow. The wetlands that exist are heavily degraded. And so that's me checking out um, this one uh, alpine. And, and now this is, this is step. This is, this is high elevation. This is you know, a kilometer in elevation or 1,500 meters, uh, I think this site is. Um, so relatively high elevation and lots of grazers. So here's a wetland. This should be heavily vegetated, and it's not. It's not. And what you can see right here are all these, in this case, sheep uh, footprints. So these, there's so many sheep here that they're, they're munching everything they can and, and nuking the landscape. One of the things that brought us to this site um, was the, the incredible, even though it's, it's still totally hammered, it's still um, the epicenter of some amazing biodiversity, at least of certain groups, one of which being birds. So here is uh, Africa. And what, what you're seeing here are major bird migration routes. Here's the equator. Major bird migration routes, right? So Turkey is right over here. And check it out. So some birds go up the coast. because A lot of them are avoiding the big Sahara, right? The big desert area here. So they kind of whoop. They go around this way, coastal, and they go up into Western Europe. But check out this other big major pathway right here, right through Turkey, right? Big pathway. So this data is many years old now, I haven't updated it. But suffice it to say, lots of birds, lots of bird species. And so we've, we started the first bird, what, what everybody else in the world calls bird ringing. We call it, uh, calls, man, it's, it's like I can't talk or anything. Um, everybody else uh, refers to this as bird ringing. We call it bird banding. We're the only country in the world that calls it bird banding. Everybody else talks about bird ringing. But the idea is put up nets, birds get caught, they don't get killed, they just get tangled. You come out and you pull them out, carefully pull them out of the net, you weigh them, measure them, sex them, ID them, all that kind of good stuff, and then you put a little band on their leg. And that band is a unique identifier marker that, that tells us the, our location, et cetera. Then we put that into a global database. And then when other stations in other countries or other parts of your country or whatever um, recapture that individual, you actually know, ah, this individual was here, flew to here that kind of thing. And uh, so from our region in Turkey, um, we have identified 300, at the time, this is old data, but 309 species, just from our one major wetland site, about two thirds of those, right? So our wetland is a hot spot for birds coming through the area. And um, right, these are where all the guys go to. Okay, so here's, here are the goals in this site. The idea was the first year or two, we wanted to see if we could do some manipulation, see if we could bolster plant abundance. If we can bol bol bolster plant density and diversity, then we hope we can bolster plant height and structure. If we can bolster that, maybe make better area for nesting of birds. Better nesting for birds, more birds are hanging out, uh, more, more birds feeding, more birds having baby birds, etc. And then if we have that, we can have the basis of, of a more consistent tourism business and we can have tourists come to see these incredible birds and um, in so doing, um, uh, uh, add money into the local economy of local villagers and everything. So they see a tangible fiscal signal 
a tangible monetary reward for having a healthier wetland, they can see some money in their pockets. Over the long term, the hope would be that we could not just influence the local vegetation, but the subsequent organisms that utilize that vegetation. So density, diversity, et cetera. Uh, insect density, diversity, uh, snakes and frogs and things like that. And then also, really importantly, a place for the local peoples to come and enjoy nature and learn about nature. Much of their landscape is heavily, heavily degraded. So this notion of just walking down the street to see some frogs or see some birds doesn't, isn't necessarily available to folks. So making essentially a protected area or, or, or elements of a more functioning ecosystem that they can go see. Are there any safeguards in place to keep it this way? We'll talk about that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so again, the idea is we want to go from... Um, uh, small scale to big scale. So the first scale, which is just a couple meters in size, you've seen this before, is going to be this um, Kafka uh, wetland, grassland restoration thing. And then we want to go to hundreds of meters, and that's going to be this, this exclusion area around the, the sides of this big lake. And, and then if that works, we want to go to hectares, and that's this much larger phased um, restoration. So let's start at the first one, Kafkas. So this is the university. And, uh, and here is the old power plant. You can tell, look all that wonderful soot-stained uh, smokestacks. Um, this is actually the veterinary school, or part of the veterinary school. And this is this wetland area. That we're, and I'm taking this picture. For the first few years, we would stay in essentially the dorms that are there. I'm taking this picture of a dorm where I'm staying. Eventually, our NGO, we, we now have an apartment in town uh, about 10 minute drive from here. So, but back in the day, this is where we used to stay. And so, my idea was so this area is heavily grazed by sheep and primarily sheep in this area. So, have a look. Everything is grazed down to nothing, nubs. And so, my first question was hey, can we come in? And can we, I can tell you guys all kinds of stories about the backstories of this, but the, sh the short version is, hey, is it okay if we go in and we put in some fences just to keep the grazers off? So I get a sense of how much biomass the grazers are eating. So we get permission from the university president. Okay, cool, great. And so we put this in. Notice the technology we're using at the time is sledgehammer. And, uh, and so this is basically putting in stakes in a, in a three meter by, wait, were these three meter by three meters? Oh man, I'm getting old, I can't remember. It might have been five meter by five meters, I can't remember. Anyway, basically put in stakes that we had to build. These are just angle bar that we cut and weld on a little cross beam. Um, and now we're stretching off this chicken wire around just to keep out these big guys. And you can see this is relatively, each of these is relatively small. So here's the first year of experiments. This is the wetland and you can tell it looks really artificial. It's, it's, uh, it's manipulated, but this is the wetland and uh, this is this native uh, Juncus uh, wetland species. So this is the core of the wetland, and this is area where most of the water is retaining during the dry time of the year before it completely evaporates. And so here I have these series of paired cages. So each one has a cage, or it just has that area with those, with those posts and no fence. So the, the, the grazers have access or they don't have access. That's the entirety of this super exciting experiment. And this is what we found. So after a season, so I would, I would typically go um, in fall and then go back in spring and check it. This is what we had. So in terms of plant cover, um, what we see is, so these areas the grazers were excluded from, and these areas the uh, plants uh, were allowed to graze. And so this is just total cover. This is looking straight down. And what we see is, uh, surprisingly, when we don't have the grazers in, there's a lot more. It's almost 100% cover of vegetation, so significantly different. Similarly, plant height. Plant height, the things are, things are you know, about a quarter meter tall. The vegetation is about a quarter meter tall without grazers. With grazers, it's more like a couple centimeters tall, right? So, wow, that's super exciting. Uh, richness, similar. So check it out. So richness is similar uh, depending on if it's grazed or ungrazed, but if we talk about the wetland species, wetland specific plants we want to encourage, 
Without grazers, boom, they do great. So what this is telling us is that the grazers really like to eat these wetland plants. They, they appear to be really tasty, and when they're there, they'll go munch them down. 2008, we repeated the experiment. We just added some more inside the, um, inside the marsh and you know, basically saw the same thing. Um, so this is what it looks like when we were starting, right? Uh, not a heavy growth time. This is, this is just after the, the snow is starting to melt. But this is um, after uh, they've been up for a while. And you, you don't need any statistics to see this, right? The other great thing about this is most of these herders are uh, illiterate, uneducated folks. They don't, they don't read statistics journals. They don't read academic journals. They don't go to conferences. But we can show them this. When I ask them beforehand, hey, so if I put, why do you do this? Well, because I want more plants. More plants, there won't be more plants there. Oh, sure there will be. No, there won't. So they all thought I'd have an inch or two more of plants height if, inside this area. So when we had this area that's you know about a half meter tall in this picture, um, they are thinking, whoa, that's really cool, right? So from this, we can calculate, uh, since there's vat, Grazers have access to just about all the land. We can talk about um, how much overgrazing is going on. This is an area I didn't realize. That. I just was walking through a minefield because they don't they don't sign the minefields. So I was super lucky; it didn't blow up. But <laughs> suffice it to say, this area it looks like it's maybe the southwest, right? It looks like maybe it's some really cool sandstone hillsides. No, that's bare soil. So massively overgrazed, there are almost no macroscopic plants there. It's hard to explain to you guys how moonscape this this land is. It really, really is nuked. There's a couple. You see a little bit of nubs in the foreground here. You see some plants here. These are mostly unpalatable species. This is just if you look at it, it's just um, when when rain. If you guys have taken Dr. Patch's uh, oceanography class or Dr. O'Hyrick's water resources class, and when 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 bare soil gets hit by a droplet of water it'll just form this kind of mud mud droplets that's what this is this whole hillside is just naked soil that's eroding and the whole this whole part of the country is basically eroding into the ocean it's crazy so what we what i calculated was that 93 percent of the net primary productivity from that whole region is consumed by grazers that's that's insane it, it, that's 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 bizarre um and that equals to something like 192, you guys, this, these stats won't matter to you guys, but 192 million metric tons of biomass is consumed by cattle, sheep, and goats. Um, and so this is by far the biggest restoration hurdles. How do we just deal with this? And, and, then, and then there's a knock-on effect, right? So we talked about above-ground biomass inside-outside. The only place we saw significant mammal burrows were in my plots, right? Because the the burrowing mammals were probably like, oh my God, there's food here. I can come actually eat for a change. So we saw a significant increase in, in things like insects and mammals. Um, so part of our goal is to build capacity. So this is, this is me in a machine shop and we're showing these guys how to build some, some basic restoration tools, post pounders, which you would have thought this was the most amazing thing. So, so these guys are almost going to kill themselves by swinging these sledgehammers above their head, trying to knock my, my uh, stakes into the ground. So at one point I say, hey, why don't we just use a post pounder? Like, huh? So I have my friend translate post pounder. I don't know how to translate post pounder. Describe it. Huh? Don't understand. So we finally build one. And, and these guys are, oh my God, can I have this when you leave? Right? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a business around this. Right? So essentially what a post pounder is, you can just go to Home Depot and get it. It's essentially a, a, a cylinder a pipe that has one end sealed off so that you can put it around the stake and pound and it's safer, right? As opposed to swinging the sledgehammer above your head and nobody wears helmets there, right? I mean, that's super sketch and dangerous. So this is part of what we're doing as well. This is, this is, a, this is a successful outcome is showing these folks how to do things that don't necessarily cost a huge amount of money or any money, but to show them how to do stuff in, in new ways. This is, that, this is what that wetland looks like. So this is, this is uh, so me standing in here and, and uh, plants are starting to grow. Okay, 
So this is our next site, which is about half an hour drive away. Again, I have many, many stories from this place if you want to hear them. But um, this is basically, we've built a bunch of these stakes and we have some of the local villagers taking the stakes out to the wetland for us. So they're, so they're pulling them in their horse-drawn cart. Uh, this is uh, Lake Kujuk. So this is, uh, this is my first, exp this, is, this is the main experiment. So the idea here is there's a village that lives here, there's a village over here, and there's a village over here. Um, and so if you look at it, you know, it's about, it's about eight kilometers if you were to walk the entire perimeter of the, of the um, lake. This is a lake that has water in it um, just about all the time throughout the year. I mean, it, it grows and expand, it, it gets bigger and smaller, but um, there's all kinds of challenges uh, here, but um, at least in this area, there's water around it. And you can see what it looks like. Everything is grazed to hell in a handbasket, right? So my simple idea is, hey, can we come up and just fence off some small areas of here and keep the grazers out of little teeny tiny areas, right? This is kilometers and kilometers of shoreline, just little teeny small pockets, little small pockets. Can we do that? Same idea, posts go in, uh, uh, um, chicken wire is stretched around it. This is all chicken wire, and then Under out here is doing what's out here. For this part, we have, we have barbed wire down in the front, but it's open. Because ducks, a lot of times ducks, they need to, they need, they, they can't, they're not like a hummingbird, they don't go, they don't take off straight off. They need to take off and land with some, with some, you know, forward direction space. So by having this so that larger horses and things can't come in, but the fact that ducks can go in and out, this allows this area ideally to be used as nesting site for these waterfowl. Cool? So we had some initial success. One of the things that did was allow us to start to do this first uh, island restoration, what we call an, uh, called an island restoration. This was the original highway. So the, the, the Georgian border is just over here to the right. So this, this was a major thoroughfare. And then um, a decade or two ago, they actually moved the road over here. And so it bifurcated the lake, but, but they just left this in place. There's a couple very small culverts here. So we wanted to increase hydrological function so we came in and we excavated, we broke this and broke this. So we made essentially an island. In theory, if there's a lot of water here, that's also a place where birds can nest without terrestrial predators getting access to them, right? <clears throat> so this is us doing this restoration. This was one of the um, easiest restorations to do and one of the hardest. Easiest because there are no permits. You don't go to Army Corps of Engineers. There's no California Department of Fish and Game stream bed alteration permit you need to get. It's just pretty much, okay. So we convinced the governor to loan us his excavator and the guy to drive it, and we basically told him what to do. <laughs> so you can see here, so this picture is taken from right here, looking this way. So we're looking this way, and we, we're essentially severing this road, cutting it off, taking this, and then we piled this this stuff up and he's just working from side to side, side to side, side to side, and then we have better surface connections. We call this the island, the lot, we call it Lost Island because um, some of our assistants like to watch the TV show Lost and they were, they were in, all into it at that time and like, we call this Lost Island, like, like on Lost. <laughs> like, okay, okay, we'll call it Lost Island. The problem is, this is a very tough part of the world to work in. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of nepotism that pretty much drives everything. So we start seeing this happen. So I come up and, and you can see here, it actually worked, right? So we got a lot of plants growing up right here inside my plot. Outside, they're, they're not so tall. And you know, initially it was great, awesome, great, really good biomass response, but then check it out. Cut, cut barbed wire. Uh, cattle tracks inside. All the cattle have ear tags. Started finding cattle ear tags inside my exp my grazer exclusion cages. What was going on? Guys were clearly, we I did too good a job at talking to the local folks. See, there's more grass in here. So now they're like, oh my God, that's where the good grass is. Let's go put the cows in there. So then we talked to the governor, well, well the, the government guys, and we said, hey, um, we need some help here. And they said, okay, what do you need? We said, we need some guards, some guys to stand guard and make sure people aren't gonna snip this. 
So can you pay these guys a small stipend to, to you know, essentially like a, to sit around and drink tea and make sure people don't do something? Again, we don't have, there's not, there aren't a million places, right? There's a, there's a cluster here, cluster here, cluster here. We actually have a, a shack right here where we stay when we're out there. So you can be out of the wind and everything. Not too hard. You can see all of these from one spot with, if you have binoculars. Um, they're about a half kilometer apart. So, okay, so we get money for guards. Awesome. And so it looks like things are working. So here we go. Check it out. Here is outside. Nothing. Everything's grazed to hell in a handbasket. Hand inside, lots of biomass, lots of productivity, duck egg nests. Oh, my God, great. Way more frogs I'm finding inside the plots than outside. Oh, my God, that's so awesome. Woo, I'm so smart. Woo, right? Uh, there's another uh, shot of what it looks like outside, right, versus inside. So we have wetland plants going. We have more terrestrial grasses going. Everything seems great. So the idea is we're getting ready to say, hey, the next phase, let's fence off a significant portion of the edge. The villages are really worried. They, that's where their cattle and folks get water from. No problem. We're not going to do the entire perimeter. We're just going to do some chunks of it, right? Just enough to have more nesting area for, um, for these birds. Just, and, but, you know, there'll still be large swaths where you guys can go down the water, take your animals down the water, do whatever. Okay, they say. Um, I guess I didn't put another picture in because it's too sad. Uh, we come back next year, all the cages are cut open. Everything is grazed down to nothing. Talk to the guards, what's going on? Oh, well, uh, you know, cattle are really strong. No, dude, the cattle don't have snippers. Someone snipped the metal. Well, you know, whatever. So the Turks think that cattle have prehensile thumbs or something, right? They think they're very advanced cattle. Um, so basically, they got bored and they didn't feel like doing their job. So we get new guards, same thing, same thing. So they, they're not there, we drive up, there's no guards around, what's up? Oh, well, my back was hurting, so I was blah, 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 right? Um, and it goes on from there. So our NGO, so I last spent my, I spent my sabbatical there, my last sabbatical, a good chunk there, doing some assessments of some other activities the government was doing. They're not, um, I gotta figure out how to say this correctly. So they, um, it's very difficult to do restoration in a situation where you don't have the rule of law. And uh, in this case, this is, this is a democracy. People are being elected. But they have their own priorities. And they've changed the constitution since I've been working there to do certain things. Um, you might have heard in the news this morning, um, they've recalled a bunch of their generals in NATO, and several ge generals have asked for political asylum and don't want to go back to Turkey because they believe they will be persecuted. Some of my assistants have had their heads beaten in by, by some of the government forces. Um, it's, it's a tough, tough place. To be sure, they have incredible challenges. They're trying to deal with insurgent terrorists. They're trying to deal with... Syrian folks, they have Russians, they have, they have it, it's a very, very challenging situation. I'm sensitive to that. But what we would find is when the government's whim changed, all of a sudden, boom, our cages are cut open, right? You cannot build a successful conservation program, in my opinion, in that kind of a situation. You put all, years and years into this and, and very little to show for it. So I've actually stopped going to Turkey for a variety of reasons, some of which includes the fact that I wrote a report critiquing the government's uh, <laughs> activity on this river, this dam building thing, and they didn't like that very much. Um, but it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge. One of the main things I would do when I would go there is teach other Turkish students. So Turkish students would take a week or two off of their classes, mostly university students, 
and they would travel out to volunteer with us and I would teach them how to do vegetation monitoring, how to do bird counting, how to do insect counting. A lot, huge amount of my time was spent doing that. And uh, so with the idea being that they would be the real restoration people, they just call me when they had a problem and I'd help them through a problem, but, but they would heal their own country. That's all basically stopped uh, now. The, uh, they basically essentially deleted the biology department at the university where we work primarily um, by essentially not allowing you people to be biology majors, which, were the, which was the main source of technicians for us. Uh, so it goes on and on and on. We had tremendous success, especially with school kids, getting them turned onto wetlands and all this and that. I'm not sure what phase we're in of our restoration. So we're following this great phased approach. It was, it was going well, but we should be at the largest phase, and it's essentially been indefinitely on pause because of the po political support and, and uh, safety conditions in that, that area. Um, we originally had large governor, government buy-in, and we had a, a lot of college student, um, a lot of growing villager support. Um, now a lot of my students that were helping me have gone to school outside of the country of Turkey because they um, can't get the education they'd like to in there. Um, but we hope we've started the nucleus of a, of a small cadre, not as big as we'd like, a small cadre of conservation practitioners inside the country of Turkey. So it should be a lot more, but it's, it's, we're, we're frozen. When we would win these awards, these international awards, these are some different things we've got. We got Kuja declared a, a Ramsar site, a wetland of international importance. We won this Eden Award, which is a European award for sustainable tourism and stuff. We've won all these things. When we win awards, people are really like us, right? Oh yeah, great, good press, mm-hmm, yeah, right, great. As soon as we would say something that maybe wasn't as flattering, it was bad times, and it remains bad times. They've been threatening to pull our scientific collection permits, um, all kinds of stuff. And uh, my colleague, who's, who's considered a bigwig um, and, and goes on Turkish CNN and all this kind of stuff, we have some presence because of that, because he knows certain people in the government we can call. But that's getting harder and harder and more and more challenging. And without that, there's no possible way we could do work uh, there. Um, and really, the, the, the corruption and, uh, and challenges from the highest levels of government make it very, very hard to work. Um, they, uh, one of the universities in Ankara, the capital, had a little teeny, super tiny, small forest plot, a couple hectares, right? The government said, ah, we think we want to put a road through there. I mean, one of the last, I mean, it, it's, it's almost, it's like a comedy. It's like, really, you want to put a road through there? Yeah, I want to put a road through there. No, we shouldn't. Faculty protests, students protest. Okay, they wait till they're on uh, essentially a religious holiday. And they go and they bulldoze the road in the middle, middle of the weekend. I mean, these guys, they think the best thing to do with national parks is to put a tourist hotel in there or a hotel that works for the party elite. It, it, it truly is folks that have no, no um, environmental ethic. Even in this environment, the design seemed to be robust. The response of the vegetation was robust. The response of small mammals and birds and insects was robust. We know the idea worked and could work should we have a change in government? Should we have a change in the motivation of the people? And we could clearly go on to the next phase, but uh, it's a little hard to at this moment. So this is um, one of the things that, that has been a bit, bit more successful. This is a, what we would call a grizzly bear. They call a brown bear there. So this guy is tranquilized. So we've caught him in a trap and we've taken some samples and we're putting on, just put on a GPS collar where he's about to wake up, just about to give him a shot. And so, uh, so the challenges are legion, but um, in this case, the, this was a, we had problems with a dump where people were dumping food and, and these predators were coming in, boar and wolves and bear, and gonna create a, creating a human wildlife conflict uh, place. Um, 
And so it was a huge challenge. So we started doing this uh, tag, c capturing and tagging these large carnivores to figure out where they roam. We've used that to pitch a new protected area, a new, a new national park. And so, you know, things, that sounds great. That sounds good. More data is good. But when we went and talked to the government minister to give you a sense of how challenging things are, the head of essentially what would be the Department of the Interior for us, go talk to him, start talking about bears. As we're talking about bears, start calls in his assistant. Hey, where are we with the bear hunting proposal? That's the level of folks that we're talking about, right? So it's a really, really hard place to work. And, it, and you guys have to decide as you guys go on into your careers, if you want to go down one of these conservation paths, um, where you want to work. It's challenging because it's much, you have a much bigger impact, right, per, per day of your life in a place like this, right? You're going you're gonna to take it from zero to 10 is a much bigger impact than taking something from 80 to 90, right? So this, we, need, we need conservation, we need support, we need sustainable development in these places desperately. The challenge is when you don't have institutions that you at least have some modest notion that they can carry through and carry us through, it, it's tough. It's tough to work in places like that because you work for years and years and years and some idiot with a swo swoop of the pen or a ring of the phone call can delete some of those conservation advances. Um, but uh, my friends are still there, my friends are still working, and so um, hopefully we're going to have good, good outcomes, but it is a challenging place, and our restoration work has basically been frozen. <laughs> so we, we do have capacity, that, that was my friend Ondar. Uh, we do, we, we're building capacity, and, and you know, there's some wonderful people there trying really, really hard to do good stuff. It is just a, a, a challenging environment. So phased experiments can work, but to have a successful restoration outcome, we need more than just large-scale spatial buy-in and large-scale methodological buy-in. We also need institutional buy-in and institutional support at, at all levels of, of uh, government and society as well. It's not just a government thing. Um, so there you go. It's a little bit about uh, multi-scale restoration for you guys.